my name is Louise Stevenson. I'm an environmental toxicologist at Oak Ridge National Lab, and today I'm going to talk to you all about the research that we do in the toxicology lab, or I'm going to call it the tox lab. I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, but I ended up working on a research project with a professor in college looking at the effect of phytoestrogens on Siamese fighting fish. Phytoestrogens are plant estrogens, so plant hormones. All organisms have hormones, and they're actually very structurally similar across a lot of organisms. These plant-based estrogens um, serve a role in the plants, but when they accumulate at high concentrations downstream of pulp mills or places like that, they can actually pose an environmental effect on natural systems. So we looked at the effect of these plant-based estrogens on Siamese fighting fish, which are beta fish, which are fish that I imagine a lot of y'all have had at some point in your lives. You can buy them at any pet store. These Siamese fighting fish are really beautiful fish. The males have large fins and they flare. So they'll very aggressively flare their opercular fins. Those are the fins by their face or the fins on their backs. And that's a sign of aggression. And so if they see a conspecific or an organ another beta fish, they'll think, oh, I need to show this beta fish who's boss. They flare, flare, flare. And you can actually put a mirror up to a, a container with a fish in it, and that fish will flare at what it thinks is another beta fish literally until death. And so what we did is we looked at the effect of phytoestrogens on that behavior, and we found that with exposure to phytoestrogens, males actually became much less aggressive. And eventually through future work, that lab was able to identify that that decreased aggression was related to changes in the neurotransmitters in the fish's brains. But this research really led to my passion for environmental toxicology. I gave up wanting to be a marine biologist and decided that environmental toxicology was really what I was passionate about because the problem of just one little fish and one little beaker and one little lab and one little college actually has applications to the whole natural world. So when I talk about environmental toxicology, I'm talking about the impact of various chemicals on natural systems. So these are usually chemicals that are introduced anthropogenically or by humans. You can think about these chemicals as everything from personal care products, so be some Tylenol or Advil that you take when you have a headache or a prescription that you're prescribed by a doctor, vitamins, to things that you use around your house. So cleaning products, either for cleaning surfaces or thinking about doing your laundry, all the way to large scale chemicals that we use for various applications. So applications like water sanitation, energy extraction, things like that. So when we talk about environmental toxicology, we're trying to get at the ecological risk that these various chemicals can have on our natural environment. So that's how I became interested in this field, and so I went on to get my PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. There I studied the effect of nanomaterials on freshwater systems. So when I say freshwater, I'm thinking about lakes and streams, water that's less salty than the ocean. Nanomaterials are very, very, very small materials. Nano is a prefix like micro or milli. It means 10 to the minus ninth. So these are super small things. This is on the scale of DNA. DNA is about two and a half nanometers. These are very, very small particles that are engineered for various applications. And we were interested in looking to see if they had any sort of toxic effect on natural systems. And if that toxicity was different from what we call their bulk forms. So one of the particles that I looked at was nano silver. And so silver is present in its ionic form. Is the toxicity of nano silver, very, very small silver, different from dissolved silver, bulk silver, things like that? So those are the types of questions that I study as an environmental toxicologist. Here at ORNL in the tox lab, which is where we are now, we do a lot of experiments relating to either regulatory testing, so permit-based tests that I'll talk about in a second, or more investigatory focused tests. So looking at the effects of novel compounds, specific chemicals, things that we're particularly interested in. So the regulatory based work that we do is using um, EPA or Environmental Protection Agency standardized methods. So these are methods that are very, very well standardized. They're very well defined. So that means theoretically, Results that I get in my lab here in Tennessee are the same as results anyone would get in Switzerland, as Zimbabwe, as anywhere else, because we're using the same methods. And so they are very standardized, including standardization of what organisms. When we think about the effect of various chemicals on the environment, how do we actually estimate the effect? How do we estimate ecological risk? So one of the ways that we do that is we look at the effect of these chemicals on model organisms. So we look at the effect on various fish, or worms, or in my case, mostly plankton or zooplankton. And so we look at effects of various compounds on fish and zooplankton in this lab, and we use what are called model organisms. So the word model organism here means both. It's a model in the sense that it is, this organism is being used as an example of all the biological diversity that is related to it. It's also a model organism in the sense that 
This is an organism that's studied really widely in the lab for a lot of various reasons, biologists, evolutionary biologists, ecologists, a lot of different studies focus on these organisms. And so we know a lot about them and how they act in the lab and also how they act in nature. So the model organisms that we use are mostly fathead minnows, that's a fish, and then Daphnia. So our model organisms, we look at the effect of various compounds on the survival of these organisms, and then also what are called sublethal effects. So a lethal effect of a potential contaminant is exactly what it sounds like. Does it decrease the survival of that organism? A sublethal effect is something, an effect that is less than lethal, sublethal. So these are effects on things like growth, reproduction, we could look at behavioral effects. There's a whole range of endpoints we could look at when we're trying to estimate the toxicity of a compound. For these standardized tests, we mostly look at growth for fish and reproduction for Daphnia. When we're doing a regulatory-based test, if any sponsor has a permit in order to discharge water into a natural system, so discharge effluent, then we take a sample of that effluent and we want to make sure that it would not have an impact on the environmental system into which it's introduced. So let's say a uh, wastewater treatment plant um, releases a bunch of effluent after it's been treated into a creek. We would take a sample of that effluent, we would test it in the lab, we would expose our model organisms in the lab to that effluent, and we would see if it impacts survival, growth, reproduction, um, and then be able to test, okay, does this effluent pose an ecological risk to the community? The more investigatory tests that we do here at ORNL are in collaboration with other scientists here. So we work with material scientists to develop new chemicals. So if a material scientist is developing a novel lubricant or something like that for an application that's gonna go into the water, let's say, that material scientist wants to make sure that that lubricant is not going to have an effect on any aquatic ecosystems if it, if it spills, if it gets released during normal use. And so that material scientist will develop that compound, give us a sample, we'll test the toxicity, compare it to what's commercially available, is it more or less toxic? And then iteratively, we've worked with scientists in the past, material scientists and chemists, to develop a more green chemical. So a chemical that has less of an impact on ecological communities. Also in terms of investigatory studies, we're doing a lot of work trying to look at effects across biological scales. Looking at the effect of a contaminant on the individual level, does it decrease growth, reproduction, survival? We can also look at impacts on the suborganismal level or the molecular level of gene expression, changes in the concentrations of proteins or other things that are important for basic function of any organism. We can also look at effects on whole populations and communities, but these levels are obviously all connected. So as an ecologist and as a biologist, we're all really interested in looking at how can we extrapolate these effects across these levels. So one of the model organisms that we use in the tox lab that I was talking about previously are called Daphnia. So these are crustaceans. So they're crustaceans like crabs and lobsters, but much, much, much smaller. At maximum, they get about four millimeters in length, so very small. And these are really important prey items for fish, and they're also very ecologically important. So these are what we call filter feeders. So they filter water through their bodies in order to get food. They basically just throw food at their face in order to eat it. And so they interact with a lot of the water. So these are model organisms for the reasons that I was explaining earlier, but also because they serve as kind of a canary in the coal mine of aquatic toxicology. So canary in the coal mine, the idea for that was for coal workers, if the canary got sick or died, they had an idea that there was something in the air that they were being exposed to that was bad. Similarly for Daphnia, because they are filter feeders, we know that they're going to interact with a lot of the water, and so we use them as a model organism to get an idea of, okay, if this contaminant is in the water, is it going to have an effect on this very sensitive species? So Daphnia are what are called zooplankton. If you go into any freshwater body and scoop up a handful of water, you're likely to find them. Fish eat them, other invertebrates, those are organisms without a backbone, eat them as well. So they're used widely in environmental toxicology and evolutionary research and other uh, similar research projects. The reason that we love them also for environmental toxicology is because they can actually reproduce asexually. So they can reproduce um, clonally without a male or any sexual recombination. So they reproduce clones. They produce literally clones of themselves. They lay eggs on their backs. The female Daphnia lay eggs on their backs into the brood pouch. Those eggs sit there for about two days. After about two days, they turn into embryos, so tiny little Daphnia with eyes. After three days of development, the de little offspring, what we call neonates, those are babies, in the brood pouch of the mama Daphnia start jostling, jostle, 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 jostle until they basically force the mom to molt. So they break what's called the carapace. So remember, these are crustaceans. So if you think about lobsters and crabs, how they molt and have a carapace or an external shell, that's the same idea of what we're talking about with these Daphnia. So the mama Daphnia molts, the offspring swim out, 
and go on their merry way. So that's fascinating ecologically, but it's also really useful for environmental toxicology because it means that we can hold a single Daphnia, da a single Daphnid in a cup and look at the effect of reproduction through time. We don't need to introduce a male Daphnid, the mama Daphnid could do it on her own. And we can also have multiple cups of the female of these Daphnia and look at replication through time. So for a standard test, we'll have 10 cups at every treatment. So if we're looking at the effect of a novel chemical, we'll expose 10 Daphnia to the same chemical, and we'll get an idea of a sublethal impact on reproduction, and also the variability of that response. So maybe one cup reproduction is decreased by 75%, but in another cup, reproduction isn't affected at all. Then we have an idea that maybe we need to look further into this compound to get a better idea of its mode of action or how toxic it is. So that's one of the reasons why Daphnia are so widely used in environmental toxicology and are such a wonderful model organism.